our last prophet we're going to look at today, and that is Micaiah. Micaiah. Um, and this section is called the bearer of bad news, right? We have so many people that unfortunately, um, <laughs> they're, they're looked at as the bad news prophets, right? Every time they look up and they see you coming, you, you don't have a good prophecy, right? You, you have something to say that people are probably not going to want to hear, even if you say it with a smile on your face, right? This was the kind of <laughs> this was the kind of prophet that Micaiah was, right? So Micaiah's no in the face of 400 yeses angers King Ahab, right? And as a person who is a prophet, a part of your training, right, is to get to know what kind of prophet you are. A part of your training is to get to know where God is sending you what kind of subject matter God is going to have you dealing with. Is God going to primarily use you with individuals or is he calling you to nations? Is he calling you to leadership? Does he deal with you with particular gender issues? Um, for us, God deals with, with my husband and I in the governmental realm. So a lot of things that we speak on and a lot of things that we um, God gives us prophetic insight into has to do with the government and our nation and how our nation is going to be affected by other nations. And so when we're dealing with people, especially in the political realm, a lot of them, um, you know, don't necessarily have prophetic insight. So when we talk to them and we're sharing different things with them, sometimes they give us the side eye. <laughs> sometimes they kick us out of their groups. Sometimes they say, we don't really want to hear what you have to say. And then when an election is over or election season is over or that presidential candidate is out of office, then they can look back at what we warned them was going to happen during that, that election season or during that person's uh, presidency. And they can say, you know what? I didn't agree with you, but you were right. And then we just come back and say, well, hey, it wasn't our word. It was the word of the Lord. We weren't moved by the opinions of man. We were moved by what God was telling us was about to go down. So even with, um, you know, this current president, one of the things that we warned about was that, number one, he was going to win. We didn't want him to, but that was kind of what God was showing us was that he was going to win because there was going to come somebody who was going to set the nation back in time and that there would be issues of rolling back of laws and rolling back of civil rights. Well, if you looked at the two candidates, the person who was more, most likely to do that was not Hillary Clinton. So God began to have us to begin to talk on that and to begin to prepare people and to begin to teach about presidents kings, prophets, and priests. We taught on that for several months. Then we began to prepare people concerning what could possibly happen if this country started rolling back its laws. Then we get, began to prepare people concerning what could possibly happen if this country would go into martial law. So we spent our time preparing the people who were listening to us, right, for what could possibly happen so that when they see these things, they don't start to panic and they don't start to act out in fear and they don't start to have anxiety. Why? Because they've already uh, been taught. They've already have an expectation that God is going to be with them regardless of what goes down in this country. If you are on the Lord's side, you're going to be OK. Right. So there's no need to, to fear and there's no need to fret. And there's no need to get caught up in all the anxiety that's happening. Yes, we know that we are in a time where lies seem like the truth, where lies are being put out as OK, where there's lots of espionage happening. But if you're in the will of the Lord, he's going to help you and he's going to guide you. and He's going to navigate you through all of that. Yes. Alternative facts, all of that stuff. So now you have this king. Amen. Well, praise God. Now you have this king, right? 
And so Micaiah's message or Micaiah's assignment to this particular king is to really be the voice of reason or the voice of dissent, right? So many kings in history have surrounded themselves with yes men. Many leaders in history, many spiritual leaders have surrounded themselves with yes men to the point where they cannot hear God because they have so many yes men around them. They do. They have too many what the what many would call psychophants, right? Who tell them exactly what they want to hear. In this season, you cannot have people around you who are telling you exactly what you want to hear. You need to have people around you who are telling you what the word of the Lord is, regardless of your feelings. <laughs> this is how serious it is. You cannot afford to have people giving you information based on buddy, buddy. You can't afford to have people giving you information based on nepotism. What's nepotism? That's when your family is so involved and interconnected into your ministry that they're so that that family members are familiar with you. And so they can't hear from the Lord because they have too much of a connection, familiarity with you. Not saying that God has not raised up some people's family members to lead with them in ministry. But oftentimes you have people that are put into place. Yes, nepotism. You have people that are put into place simply because, oh, that's my mother or that's my brother or that's my sister or that's my aunt. And they have no qualifications for the positions that they're being placed in. If they don't have the qualifications, you they should not be in place. And oftentimes this is what runs some people away from churches because they go into a church or they go into a ministry and they look up and all they see is the family members in charge like it's the mafia. <laughs> and so um, it sends a signal to people when they enter your ministry that there's really no room for other voices outside of your family members. And God forbid... If you say something contrary to what the family members have already told them, then you're going to be labeled as Jezebel or whatever. And, you know, more than likely you will experience serious warfare because of nepotism. Has nothing to do with whether or not, yes, it does hinder growth. Has nothing to do with whether or not your word of the Lord was accurate. It has to do with who's put in place who actually then becomes a hindrance or a barrier to the word of the Lord being released wherever you are. All right. So a true prophet of God was supposed to be above this kind of thing when counseling the king. That's why it's important that prophets keep a level of purity and a level of separation and consecration so that they can hear from the Lord and that they can deliver words to the leadership that's untainted. How can I deliver a pure word of the Lord to you if I'm always in your face? I'm always, you know, out hanging out with you, right? There's got to be a measure of separation and consecration so that what I have to say to you can be received in purity and it's not being tainted by something that I've overheard. All right. So Micaiah was the kind of prophet that was to speak only the words God gave him to speak and then be quiet. <laughs> now I am a scribal prophet, meaning that if the Lord gives me a word, I generally tend to write it down and if it's for someone else or if it's, if it's for a nation or if it's for a church body, I will write it down. I will time stamp it. I will type it up. I will meet with that leadership and I will say, hey, I have a word of the Lord for you or I have a word of the Lord for your um, congregation. And then I'll say, 
do I have permission to release this word? If they tell me no, then all I do is I give them the word of the Lord sealed because that's my responsibility is to deliver it. It's not my responsibility to read it. It's not my responsibility. It's, it's my responsibility to say, well, you don't want to receive this right now, but here's the word of the Lord. You take it and you do what you need to do with it. Okay. And so sometimes I'll get permission. Sometimes you know, they're not ready to receive that word of the Lord. There's, um, when somebody asked me the other day, what's the longest I've ever held a prophecy? And the longest I've ever held a prophecy actually was 20 years. It was the same prophecy. It was a prophecy for our country. And um, I'm starting to see some of it come to pass now, but I delivered it about three years ago. And the reason I held it was because I didn't know who it was supposed to go to because it was a prophecy for the nation. I knew that it was going to have a national impact. So I held it not knowing I prayed over it. I would read it from time to time and I would pray over it and I would say, God, I don't know who this is supposed to go to, but I trust that when it's time, I will have this prophecy and you'll be able to help me get it into the hands of the person it's supposed to get into. Well, come to find out, <clears throat> I moved to the nation's capital because the word was specifically about D.C. And I, didn't, I never imagined that I would be actually living in D.C. to see this prophecy come to pass. So I moved in, into this region and I went to a, a policy summit. And at that policy summit was the head of the nation's largest lobby for Christians. And the Lord said to me, get that prophecy out because I had moved. So I had to go and find my notebook that had that prophecy in it. I made a copy. He said, get that prophecy out and deliver it to him. And so... I delivered that word of the Lord to him. It was a warning about this nation. It was a warning about if we did not turn, what was going to happen. And this man now has the ear of our president. So you never know what God is trying to orchestrate or what God is trying to arrange if you don't first obey the first instructions. And many times the first instructions is not to open our mouth and begin to prophesy. Many times the first instruction is write it down. <laughs> okay. So a lot of what we have in scripture, even though it was delivered to leadership and even though it was delivered to nations and even though it was delivered to kings, it was written down. It was written down so we could have a record in the future of what would come to pass and what has already come to pass. All right. So Micaiah was to speak only the words God gave him to speak. So when 400 prophets said yes to two kings and only one prophet said no, discerning the truth became a little dicey. In the divided kingdom of Israel, Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, the southern kingdom, and Ahab was king of Israel, the northern kingdom. All right. So when Ahab suggested that the two halves of the kingdom join forces, Jehoshaphat reminded Ahab to first seek the counsel of the Lord, right? Because they were getting counsel from everybody. So Ahab gathered together his best group of 400 prophets, right? All these guys only had good news for Ahab. He, they said if the kings went to war, God is going to assure their victory. Ahab must have smiled to himself because these prophets told him exactly what he wanted to hear. How unlike his dealings with Elijah, right? God's man on Mount Carmel, who had only, he, feel, he felt like he had only been born to oppose anything that Ahab was doing. So there was something about the word yes from the prophets that didn't sit well with Jehoshaphat. Surely there had to be somebody else who could offer some advice. So perhaps Ahab, you know, maybe he might have groaned and recounted, you know, because he said there's this one prophet who never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. OK, but it wasn't Elijah. 
This prophet was Micaiah, the son of Imla. And after being counseled to agree with what the 400 prophets had said, they actually called Micaiah in and said, you know what? I need you. We need you to agree with what we've already said. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't think that's going down in the prophetic right now. <laughs> oh, Jesus, we need you to agree with what is already been said. We need you to agree with what we've said about this current president. If you're going to be on the prophetic scene. If you're going to be in our circuits making money. If you're going to be on the platform with us, you're going to have to agree with what we've already said about this president. So they do the same thing to Micaiah here. They, they bring him in and they say, you're going to have to agree with what we've already said is going to happen to Ahab in this battle. All right. And so. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can only tell him what the Lord tells me. When face to face with the two kings, Micaiah provided a sarcastic agreement as if acknowledging, yeah, this is what you want to hear, King Ahab. So, yeah, you're going to do great. You're going to do well. You know, your ministry is going to spring forth and it's all going to be good and wonderful. But then Ahab recognized his sarcasm and demanded a real answer. Isn't that amazing? Some people will bring you in to be a false voice. And then when they recognize that you are being sarcastic or you are accommodating their need for a false voice, then they want the real deal. So. Ahab says, give me the real deal. Let me know what's really going down. Then Micaiah told the story about God's throne room in heaven as the setting. Prophets have the ability to hear the conversations that are happening in the throne room. I know some people don't ascribe to that, but I know I've heard it. I even wrote a, a, a song about it. It was called A Prophetic Charge, where you began to hear the counsel of the Lord. So Micaiah tells him what has happened in God's throne room. Micaiah explains that God has allowed a lying spirit to speak through the prophets who agreed with Ahab's plan of war. He said Ahab would die in battle because the Lord was not with him. Now keep in mind, Micaiah, who probably didn't necessarily like Ahab, is giving him a warning. He's telling him, if you go out into this battle, you're going to die in it. Meanwhile, you have all of these false prophets surrounding him, promising him good success in something that is ultimately going to be his death. And this is where, as prophets, there's a serious responsibility and a serious accountability that has to happen when you deliver the word of the Lord. Because it can be a matter of life and death. This is why you can't speak what you want to speak and why you really should only be speaking what the Lord is telling you. <laughs> All right. So. Zedekiah, one of the 400 prophets, yes ma'am, was not about to take this accusation lying down. So he retaliates by slapping the taste out of the prophet's mouth. Now I don't know how many of us could handle uh, being in a service and you're prophesying a word and another prophet comes up to you and says, well you're lying and they slap you. <laughs> they slap the taste out of your mouth. Right. So he retaliates by slapping and mocking Micaiah, but it couldn't stop the word of the Lord from coming true. Somebody needs to hear that today. It doesn't matter if they mock you. 
it doesn't matter if they want to slap the taste out of your mouth. The, the, the reality is, if it's the word of the Lord, it's not going to stop it from coming to pass. It's not going to stop it from coming to pass. Why? Because it's not your words. All you're doing is releasing the voice of the Lord and releasing the word of the Lord for that situation. So, while Micaiah was thrown in prison for speaking the truth, because sometimes our places of, of confinement are because we spoke the truth, not because we spoke a lie. So he gets thrown into prison. And I liken this in, in today's context. Some of us get kicked out of groups. Some of us get thrown in Facebook jail uh, for preaching the gospel or sharing the truth. Somebody reports us, right? And says, oh, what they're, what they're saying is abusive. No, it's not. It's the truth. So he gets thrown in prison for speaking the truth. Then the kings go to war anyway. But even after disguising himself, an arrow found King Ahab. Listen. Listen. Even after disguising himself in the war, he really thought that he could out disguise himself against a death warrant. An arrow found him. An arrow found him. Not a, per not a person. An arrow found him. And death came. Just as Micaiah had prophesied. <clears throat> Micaiah was willing to be the bearer of bad news in defiance of the crowd. And that bad news that Ahab received could have saved his life had he stayed off the battlefield. The bad news was actually good advice. Think about that. The bad news, <clears throat> the warning was actually good advice. But what did they do? They restricted the prophet. They physically restrained him by putting him in jail. And then everybody went out to do what they wanted to do. And it caused Ahab's death. And this is what the Lord told me. He said, number one, I am the one who birthed prophets who are born to oppose evil. Some of you are going to see, you're going to see God birth prophets who are born to oppose evil because we've had very little opposition to evil for so long. So they're going to come out the womb, <laughs> literally, they're going to come out the womb opposing evil. Some of these young toddlers, Four, five, six, seven, eight years old. We saw a four year old boy the other day online. And you can tell that he was born to oppose evil. I know that they were probably grooming him to be a gospel singer, but he was born to oppose evil. Right? So God, He said, I birth prophets who are born to oppose evil. And then the second thing He told me as we close today. He said, the word of the Lord is like a guided, it's like a launched and guided missile. It will hit its target. You cannot disguise your spirit <laughs> or your soul. When it is the word of the Lord, it's like a launched and guided missile and it will hit its target. So you can run, you can hide, you can disguise yourself. You can put on different garments. You can act like you're not a king in war. Whatever it is, if it's the word of the Lord, it's like a launched and guided missile and it will hit its target. You can't disguise it from your spirit. You can't disguise it from your soul. It's going to do the work that he intended for it to do.